Hey everyone, uh, super privileged and honored to, to meet and speak with all of you. Um, my name is Suresh, I use he, him pronouns. I am a tech bro, so I'm a software engineer um, and I work for a global tech company headquartered in downtown Seattle uh, when I'm not busy at work or parenting with my wife, three children who were all born here in Seattle. Um, I volunteer with Tech for Housing. Tech for Housing is a group of uh, tech workers who believe that the tech boom can and should benefit everyone, that uh, Seattle should be affordable for everyone. Um, and we are members of the Hauser Neighbors Coalition that put I-135 forward, the Social Housing Voter Initiative. Um, I am pinch hitting for Tiffany, one of the co-chairs of Hauser Neighbors today. Uh, she uh, has a sick kid at home today and didn't think she'd be able to lead this discussion without a lot of interruptions. Um, <clears throat> as someone who's had many sick children at home, I know exactly where, she, where she's been. Um, and so I, I volunteered to take a break from my work day to come chat with all of you. Um, so I'm gonna launch some slides, but just before I, I do that, I'll just start with um, what is Hauser Neighbors? Uh, um, <clears throat> In let's see what year is it? Okay, yeah, in 2021, uh, uh, a group of people put together a voter initiative called Charter Amendment 29, uh, also known as Compassion Seattle, that would have enshrined sweeping people who can't afford the rent here um, in our city's constitution, our city's charter. Um, and a large number of organizations led by Real Changes Advocacy Group um, formed this coalition, How's Our Neighbors, um, uh, to oppose that and was successful that that initiative was defeated in the courts. Um, and, uh, but then we stopped and said, well, what can we do that's positive? How can we ensure that all of our neighbors have a home uh, to live in? And uh, continuing on a work that a number of people have been advocating for um, uh, we, we decided to put forward a voter initiative that would create, um, a, uh, public development authority that is chartered with creating social housing. So now I'm going to launch some slides, uh, so I can, can talk through some of the details there and definitely feel free to interrupt me. Slides will be pretty short, um, uh, so plenty of time for questions and let me share my screen. Here we go. All right, can folks see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So uh, I-135 is a voter initiative, a Seattle only voter initiative. Um, and that voter initiative uh, creates uh, the Seattle social, social housing developer. Um, so first, we should talk about what is social housing, because it's not a term that we're pretty, uh, that we're very familiar with here in the United States. Um, there's kind of four basic tenets of social housing. One of those is that the housing is publicly owned in perpetuity. My wife and I live in a townhouse that was originally built as affordable housing with a massive subsidy from the city. City owned land was sold to uh, a developer at an extraordinarily low rate. Um, uh, to build affordable housing, but that housing was not kept uh, affordable in perpetuity. My wife and I paid $800,000 for a house. It is luxury housing now. So the key distinction with social housing is that um, any public efforts that go into creating it are permanently affordable. Um, <clears throat> and, and part of that, well, I guess, uh, number one and two go, go, go together is that um, by by ensuring that the housing is is publicly owned in perpetuity, we can we can uh, 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 adhere to the second tenant, which is permanently affordable. Um, and then, uh, if you are familiar with affordable housing, various types of affordable housing that have been built in the U.S. or public housing, a key difference with social housing is it creates cross class communities. So there are a number of government agencies and nonprofits. Uh, and even some public development authorities that create and operate affordable housing in Seattle, but because of the federal tax credits they receive, they can only serve low-income uh, uh, um, residents. Uh, 
and basically and it, they can only serve folks who are earning below about 70 to 80 percent of the area median income in Seattle and what they're doing should be increased they'll be likely on the November 2023 ballot uh, um, a proposition to double the housing levy a property tax that funds um, what most of these organizations do uh, I personally encourage everyone to, to vote for that uh, what, um, however, they cannot serve middle class Seattle, um, and the goalposts really have 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 moved in in our in our efforts to 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 ensure Seattle is affordable for everyone. Seattle is now pretty much unaffordable to anyone who's not a software engineer like me. Um, and I think I, I would suspect for those of you who live in Seattle today, if you don't already own a home, but you work for the Seattle College system, you likely cannot afford to purchase a home and, and raise a family in Seattle. And as we've, you know, in, in the Hauser Neighbors uh, organization, we've gone around to speak to various communities. Uh, we found that um, that is uh, uh, an extensive, unfortunate reality. School teachers can't afford to live in Seattle anymore. Uh, we presented to the Seattle chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Architects can't afford to live in Seattle anymore. So really key distinction between social housing and, uh, and other forms of affordable housing is that anyone earning from zero to 120% of the area median income uh, will, uh, will be served by this housing. And then probably the last key distinction with social housing is that the leadership, the board, of this um, uh, public development authority will slightly more than half of the members of the board will be residents of the housing. Uh, any questions before I move on to the next slide there? I think some of this get fleshed out in the next few slides. Okay, I'll move on. Uh, I'm so yeah, sorry, more... I, it took me a minute to unmute. Sorry, Suresh. Yeah. I, um, can you talk a little bit more about AMI? Yeah, median income so, and like what that looks like in Seattle. Yeah, so area median income is uh, an unfortunate statistic that is deeply embedded in how uh, affordable housing is funded and, and various other uh, public efforts are 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 and public uh, spending decisions are made in Seattle today. I believe the area median income is about a hundred thousand uh, dollars a year for I think someone with a child, something like that, it's, it's remarkably high. Um, and, and yet it is not enough to be able to raise a family in Seattle with, given that the for-profit housing market rarely creates three bedroom or, or larger uh, rentals. And given that uh, childcare is extraordinarily expensive in Seattle because uh, childcare providers need to live somewhere uh, when their rents are high, um, childcare costs go up. So yeah, area median income is about $100,000 a year, I think. Uh, I, uh, we have, we've published, a, uh, I think, some updated numbers on that. I, I need to dig that up for you. Um, uh, I can probably get that at the end of this discussion. I did a real quick Google search, and Seattle.gov told me that it's $115,700. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's not enough to to, to raise a family in Seattle. Um, uh, you know. Uh, a mortgage on a on a house is I don't know about four thousand dollars a month. Uh, if you need three bedrooms because you have children and childcare for two children in Seattle is about four thousand dollars a month. Um, you know, in downtown Seattle, infant daycare is about three thousand dollars a month. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, Seattle is unaffordable. We have not only a homelessness problem, we have a uh, you know everyone who's not a software engineer can afford to live here problem. Uh, and pretty soon we as a city will cease to function. Um, uh, a little bit more about the board. Um, so let's see here, uh, different, different seats on the, on the board of this public development authority. Uh, um, and by the way, a, a public development authority is basically a company owned by the people. Um, Pike Place Market is actually operated as, it is a, is a public development authority. Um, so at least one, uh, let's see, seven members of the board will be residents. Uh, at least one member of the board will be a rank and file union member. Um, at least one will be a, a, a leader of a community organization that provides housing to marginalized communities. Uh, at least one board member will be a green development professional. 
one uh, board member will be an urban planning professional, one a public housing finance professional, and one a nonprofit development professional. And I believe three or four of those seats on the board, I think the last four there listed here, uh, will be um, chosen by the mayor and or the city council. I think the mayor gets one seat and the, the city council picks three seats on the board of this public development. Uh, a little bit more about AMI, and, and I, I need to update this slide here because um, <clears throat> uh, we've 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 looked at the latest numbers, and there's a, a very wide set of occupations that that sit in that eighty to one hundred twenty percent range. But in the zero to this 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 public developer, the the I one thirty five law stipulates this public developer should serve. Um, uh, members of each of these sort of income ranges in the zero to 30% range are veterans on disability, seniors living on disability, single parent households, where maybe one member is making 30 to 50% of AMI. Uh, many people who are homeless, who are unhoused, have jobs and are, are, are in this income range. Um, so uh, part of the goal of this uh, developer is to, to provide another solution for ending homelessness. Um, in the 30 to 50% range, we've got childcare workers and medical assistants and custodians and retail associates in the 50 to 80% range, um, can county public bus drivers, mechanics, administrative assistants, technicians, and the 80 to 120% range is, yeah, it's architects, accountants, uh, marketing analysts, uh, social workers, nurses, public school teachers, I would guess um, folks who teach at uh, Seattle colleges. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, this is, I think something we're pretty proud of is that, um, uh, our ability to reach, uh, a, a, a large, uh, portion of Seattle who currently cannot be served by the existing forms of affordable housing. Um, uh, a really, really unique thing about social housing is it is a pay what you can model. So the law stipulates that the rent should not be more than 30% of your income. And uh, one thing that's really, uh, really beneficial about this is there is no benefits cliff. People aren't penalized for doing better. Um, you may know, or you may have been in a situation if you live in affordable housing where you've had to turn down a promotion or extra hours um, or a new job because you your income would, would uh, grow, would exceed a threshold that qualifies you for the, the housing that you currently have. And that's not the case with social housing. Suresh, there are a couple of things in that chat I'll, I'll read to you. A um, couple of questions. Bryce, do you want to, do you want me to ask your question or do you want to jump in? I'm happy to read it. Yeah, I can just um, say real okay. quick, uh, I was just wondering, you know, right, so often these things are framed in, in these like zero sum games, there's only so much housing space, land, whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like this, but I'm also you know, wary of things that at times were meant to serve certain populations and then became, you know, resources for folks who, who are actually, you know, doing better or more well off. Uh, so I understand it's kind of hard to ask this question as we're showing that like, what it is to be middle class is maybe different than what we might assume based on the numbers. Uh, but yeah, just wondering, is there like, what would be any kind of response um, to the argument that this might take away resources from lower mm -hmm. income folks? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, the, the law that's written in I-135 um, stipulates that the this public development authority should serve folks in all four of these um, uh, income ranges. Uh, so it, uh, it won't, it's, it's the, the, the law itself protects from it becoming a, um, a resource that only serves, say, middle-class Seattleites. <clears throat> um, the other is, I think what you're getting at is, will this take money away from, say, um, other organizations that are building affordable housing? Uh, and I just want to be really clear, nothing in this law takes away any of the funding streams that are going to the existing um, uh, government agencies and nonprofits and, and public development authorities that serve folks who are uh, who have low incomes. 
Um, this does not take any funding away from them. Uh, they themselves have various constraints like the federal tax credits that they utilize, that's called the low income housing tax credit is uh, capped per year um, per state. And uh, there's nothing we can do uh, you know, at a, at a local level to, in, to, to increase that, that tax credit. And in fact, like, I think, you know, it's October, um, uh, Washington state has already, um, used up its, its, uh, its allotment of that low income housing tax credit. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I would, uh, does that, does that address your, your, your question? Yeah, I really appreciate those responses. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll also add that, you know, I, I moved to Seattle in 1999, uh, in the 20 plus years I've lived here, the GDP of the Seattle metro region has doubled. It is now about $380 billion a year. It's like equivalent to the country Denmark, slightly larger than the country Singapore. Um, we don't really have a scarcity of wealth uh in in this region uh we have a highly regressive tax system um uh so uh there there may be ways to solve that problem that are that are outside the scope of this voter initiative um but yeah we we live in an incredibly rich place thanks to the tech industry um there's no reason why we can't double the funding for low you know exclusively low income housing as well as uh as well as introduce social housing into, into the mix Thank you for saying that, Suresh. Um, I think this is this connected in my mind to, I'm gonna read something else from the chat uh, from Alex Bacon, that um, this topic will be discussed tonight um, at a, the WFSI union general membership meeting. Is that the union you're talking about, Alex? Yeah, that's right. Tonight, okay, awesome. So a 6 p.m. Um, union general membership meeting, I'm, I'm gonna, Say that that's not just limited. I'm sure they're going to welcome anyone who wants from any union at the Seattle Colleges who wants to join. Uh, 6 p.m. There's a link in the chat. I see these two things being deeply connected: our our um, labor movement right now and the movement for social housing. So I really appreciate that, Alex. And then um, Nancy has two questions about other types of housing stock. That's kind of tangentially related. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer these, Suresh. But Nancy's asking about mother-in-laws. Um, and also if anything is being done to provide infrastructure for tiny homes for the general public, not just, um, our homeless community members. So I don't right. know if you, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Seattle passed a law recently about three years ago, I think that makes it easier to build, uh, backyard cottages. That's detached accessory dwelling units, DADU, as well as sort of basement uh, uh, apartments, that's ADU, accessory dwelling units, um, that we call those mother-in-laws or, um, uh, or backyard cottages. And that's certainly uh, a welcome improvement in 80% of Seattle, uh, our land use laws due to racism. Uh, um, there's a hundred year history there, prevent building anything other than luxury houses, basically single family homes. And, and uh, that, uh, ADU reform certainly will help. Um, will the social housing uh, public developer build ADUs? Uh, probably unlikely, that's kind of inefficient. Uh, would it build um, maybe a bunch of tiny homes for folks who are not necessarily currently homeless? Uh, possibly, um, that, that, that's definitely a possibility. Um, all, however, building uh, a multifamily apartment building, if that land, if there's land available to do that, probably building a multifamily apartment building um, would be a more efficient usage of, of any funds or financing at house. I'm gonna continue a little bit more on, on, on these points here, just because uh, uh, I, I think they, they all kind of flow together, which is the pay as you go model, uh, the pay what you can model is, um, is really unique. Uh, um, uh, residents uh, will need to be earning between zero and 120% of area median income to enter this social housing, but when they do better, and that uh, is likely to happen with access to stable housing in our, in a, you know, in a huge job center in Seattle, um, 
uh, when someone's income rises above 120% of the AMI, they will not lose their eligibility. They can stay. Uh, their rent might go up, but capped at 30% of their income. And that leads to the last point, cross-subsidization. So when folks move in and then they do better, uh, they're, they're moving up income brackets, uh, possibly even above the 120% range. The public development authority that's created by this voter initiative earns back the investment it made in its residents' future. Uh, and that's really different from all the existing forms of affordable housing we have today. Today, uh, so, some, some of the, you know, the Seattle uh, Housing Authority does let people continue to live there if their income rises, but many, most of the forms of affordable housing we have in Seattle, when your income rises, you do have to leave typically. And then it's a for-profit developer that's, you know, that's, uh, that's benefiting from that stable housing uh, that you had from, from a, uh, from a, from a, uh, an affordable housing provider. So a key difference, I think, is the cross-subsidization, the fact that as you do better, you will pay more, nothing punitive, nothing extractive, um, and that helps cross-subsidize the next round of folks who are moving in at those lower income brackets. So Rush, there's one more question in the chat um, from Elisa, and it's making me see and realize like how complicated our housing market is in Seattle. Well, probably globally, but um, Elisa's asking, um, referring back to the question about detached ADUs, is there anything preventing these types of dwellings or new backyard cottages um, from being used for Airbnbs? Uh, I don't remember the details about our our uh, our ADU legislation. Um, I yeah, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember. There, it's still the ADU legislation we have is not great. Like you can't have like a condominium, like have a separate person own uh, the backyard cottage versus the person who owns, say, the house in the front. Um, so, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know the, those details. Um, I, I think in in general, my my thought is about the ADU uh, reform that we passed a couple of years ago. It's it's a small incremental improvement, but nowhere close to what we need to solve our housing uh, crisis. Um, some other things uh, about the the Seattle social housing public developer, uh, the buildings that it creates or purchases will be allowed to operate retail. Um, so it's really about building communities, not just housing. So there can be grocery stores, restaurants, uh, retail stores, daycares, health clinics, um, and there are various incentives to ensure that those rents are, are affordable for small businesses and nonprofit organizations. Um, and uh, some other really awesome things, all new buildings that uh, this uh, public developer uh, creates must be built to passive house standards. So that is an environmentally friendly standard, which is great for meeting our, our, our Green New Deal, uh, climate uh, change goals. Uh, and I'll add that um, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and all of the rebates that, that come into play next year, the uh, um, building to passive house no longer really has uh, an additional financial penalty. Um, and um, yeah, so I think getting back to like the these being permanently affordable housing, um, when the building loan is, is paid off and um, all of the extra revenue generated from rents uh, goes into acquiring and building more social housing. Um, whereas today, uh, you know, I gave the example at the beginning where like I live in a home that's now luxury housing that was originally built with with subsidies from the city. Uh, it's not, you know, it wasn't permanently affordable. Um, and and a lot of the uh, affordable housing that's built today in Seattle with federal tax credits, those tax credits only require the housing to be affordable for 30 years. Um, the law that I think created those tax credits is now coming up on about 30 years, and we're starting to see some of those buildings now revert back to market pricing. Um, so a really critical difference here is that these buildings 30 years from now 
will be generating revenue and cross subsidizing the next round of, of uh, social housing to be built. And we see that in cities around the world that have been doing social housing for a long time, like uh, Singapore and Vienna. I think in Vienna at this point, uh, roughly 60% of people uh, in the city live in social housing. And that's because they've been doing it for almost a century now. Um, Suresh, there's another yeah. great question in the chat from um, Greta. Thanks for the question. Uh, the question is, does I-135 address zoning at all? Mm, it does not. Lots of people ask this. Uh, I don't know the details. I think it's a federal level stipulation, but you cannot change zoning with a voter initiative. Um, and that's that's a huge problem. Uh, we you know we at Tech for Housing uh, and, and and the Hauser Neighbors Coalition um, uh, believe that as the city prepares its 2024 comprehensive plan, which which plans uh, for how the city will grow over the next 20 years, uh, we believe that um, our land use laws currently are very exclusionary. I don't know if any of you know this, but in 1920. Seattle's land use laws permitted building any kind of residence up to three stories high, up to 40 feet, anywhere that residences were allowed. So you could build a mansion, uh, you could build uh, an apartment building, you could build a duplex. Um, and a city planner from St. Louis uh, went around to literally hundreds of US cities uh, and said, hey, now that the Supreme Court won't let you restrict by race who can live in certain areas of the city, just change your, uh, your land use laws to establish single family zones. And that will exclude people who are black, people who have low incomes from certain parts of the city. That is the reason why we have uh, in 80% of Seattle, we ban uh, any form of housing other than a house with a yard around it, which is by uh, uh, luxury housing. Um, and, and we have an opportunity in 2024 uh, to change that. Um, and that process is already in, in place right now. The city is studying what kinds of land use reform it, it, it wants to carry out. But yeah, this, this voter initiative can't change that, but everyone, for-profit developers um, uh, uh, and uh, affordable housing developers will benefit from, uh, from reforming our current land use laws. Uh, uh, roughly 40% of the cost of building uh, you know, in a, uh, a multifamily residence is the land. Um, it's a huge reason why housing is so expensive uh, in Seattle. Suresh, there's one more question in the chat. I never know if I should read these. It feels strange. Alex, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, Suresh, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, I have some friends that live in social housing up in Vancouver, BC, and they're being pushed out um, because they make a little bit too much money now. And this was like housing that was initially built as like, you know, cross-class housing. And now the um, liberals in the city government up there, um, you know, want to uh, just kind of, you want to just put low-income people in this housing, mostly because they don't want to build more public housing, right? It's not really for just reasons. But I'm just curious, like what, if thought has been given about you know, once this, if this passes and this housing gets built, like, how do we protect it from, um, mm. you know, from the elite? Like, I think about, like, the tragedy of Yesler Terrace being taken down and all that rich, you know, housing for rich people being put up there. Um, yeah. 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 So that's a really great question. So um want to really, uh, this, this helps emphasize a, a point, important point. The Seattle Social Housing Developer is not a new government agency. It is not a new nonprofit. It is a public development authority. It is a company owned by the people. And any resident of Seattle can sue if the Seattle Social Housing Developer does not carry out what it is chartered to do in this law. And this law requires it um, uh, to be permanently affordable, to not uh, evict someone either because they make too much money or because they make too little money. So if someone enters, you know, they're making 70% AMI and then they lose their job, they don't get kicked out, they don't get evicted. And the same way if someone moves in and God forbid they go to a coding boot camp and they become a tech bro like me and they're making $200,000 a year, they don't get kicked out either. Um, so yeah, you as, uh, well, hopefully if you live in Seattle, uh, can actually sue uh, the, the, the public development authority and say it is not, uh, operating according to its charter.
Thanks, Arash. I also just want to say thank you for owning the Identity Tech Bro. It really um, changes the way that I think of people in tech. And I wish all the tech bros were like you. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> lots of us. You'd be surprised. And if you look at a map of how people voted in the 2019 um, city council election, uh, all the places where it's really expensive to live, where only tech bros live, voted against corporate backed uh, candidates. So there's a lot of us out there. Check out Tech for Housing on Twitter, Tech the Number Four Housing, uh, and Technology Sibling is the preferred term. You know, the non-gendered, uh, non-pejorative term. Uh, I think that was count, uh, coined by um, Erica Barnett at Publicola, an independent news news outlet in Seattle. Uh, a little bit more about financing. I'm sorry, Tiffany knows this a little better than I do, but here's roughly how financing works for, for social housing. Uh, and and there, is, there, are, there is some social housing already in the US, Montgomery County, Maryland has this. So a small capital grant comes in, it could be a philanthropic gift. It could be from the state legislature, like uh, uh, Representative Frank Chop, um, who was Speaker of the House in the Washington State Legislature for decades. He has endorsed uh, I-135. If he brings in funding from the state legislature, uh, capital investments, um, that, that could be um, a way that this capital grant could come in, or municipal bonds passed by the local city council. Um, that uh, in conjunction with, uh, and, and, and yeah, I want to also note the Seattle social housing developer would be, as a, a public development authority, able to issue bonds itself, so borrow money on, on Wall Street guaranteed against future rents. It would use that initial capital grant plus bonds to construct buildings. And when residents move in and pay rent, um, that helps pay off the loans plus the maintenance and operations. Um, and then uh, there's this virtuous cycle because as, uh, as residents grow in place and their economic opportunity improves, um, the higher rents are paying and also as the initial construction is paid off, that feeds into a revolving fund to help build the next set of, uh, uh, of buildings uh, owned and operated by this public developer. And I'll note that like in, in Vienna, all of, you know, 60% of, of, of uh people live in social housing and it's all backed by a pretty minimal public funding like a one percent payroll tax um which is a pretty extraordinary uh, extraordinary achievement and in in singapore it's like 80 percent of uh of residents live in social housing oh that might have been the last slide yeah uh, i'll stop sharing and and see if folks have uh more questions Uh oh, can't figure out how to stop sharing. I don't know if I can do it for you. Sorry. Okay, let I me think see. my my iPad went a oh. little haywire. Okay, I I can stop participants sharing. So here I go. All right, here we all are. Um, Alex is recommending googling Red Vienna to learn um, more history of social housing in Vienna. It is really interesting to to learn about cities that are doing this very successfully and very well. Any other questions you can do hand up or type stack in the chat like this, or you can just unmute and ask your question. Or maybe I can ask folks questions. How many of you live in Seattle? And how many of you uh, own the home you live in? And maybe the third question is how many of you uh, can afford to uh, have a family that raise children in Seattle. I, I live in Seattle and I can afford to live here because I have a landlady who, um, I don't think, I think she inherited the property. So she's not having a lot to pay on it. So we all have very reasonable rates. 
she's lucky because she has like a single tenant in each of our units. Um, and we all pay our rent every month and take care of the yard and everything. So no, I can pay affordable rent. I can't afford a family, but I don't want one. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a, you know a dwindling number of uh, of us who can uh, afford to live in Seattle because say um, the home we're living in is is owned by someone who's already paid off their mortgage. Maybe they they built it. Uh, they purchased it or built it, you know, decades ago when it was a lot cheaper. When I first moved to Seattle, my rent was about $250 a month for a bedroom in a shared house. Uh, I see one of my former housemates on the line, Jerry Wright, uh, teaches math at Seattle uh, colleges. Um, yeah, Jerry, how much was our rent? It was like, it was ridiculously low, but yeah, you know, it was the, like 250. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, the, the, you know, the owner of the house had bought it in the 60s for like $40,000, something like that. And he didn't need really to, uh, to, to, to charge market rates. Uh, he passed away, sadly, a couple of years ago. And now that house is on the, the, the for-profit market. I knocked on that door recently uh, and they're paying, they're each paying over $1,000 a month per, be per bedroom. It's a seven bedroom house. Um, So there are some interesting comments in the chat. Thank you all for share, sharing information about your living situations. It's super interesting. So Alex says, is there an option for a can't afford it by doing it anyways? Which I think is um, what a lot of folks are doing. And Elisa says, live in Seattle for now, don't own. If I have kids, we're gonna have to move. Greta lives in Seattle, rents a house with three housemates, one of whom earns more and helps the rest of us out with rent. Yeah. Um, Misty bought in 2004, could never afford to buy now, and Nancy's looking for a place to rent but bring home $30,000 a year, and it makes it difficult to locate anything. Yeah, this is this is the reality of where we are in Seattle colleges right now. Yeah, I, I want to expand on, on, um, on, I think, what one of the first uh, comments was, which is there are folks living here, um, but they are what we call in the affordable housing industry rent burdened. So their their housing costs are above thirty percent of their income, and basically our our um, our housing crisis causes poverty, right? It means that folks delay um, the decision if they want to have uh, raise children. Uh, it means folks live further. Uh, away from their job and spend more time commuting, which drives up climate change. It, if they do have children and those long commutes separate them from their family, increase their, their childcare costs, um, negatively impact uh, their, their own family, increase the stress, they're working multiple jobs. Um, so today, if you're earning minimum wage, you need to work about 85 hours a week uh, to afford a median one bedroom in Seattle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's why at the beginning, when I was talking about area median income, uh, those numbers are used extensively throughout our public policy systems, but they don't really accurately reflect the fact that someone who earns a hundred thousand dollars a year in Seattle is actually, uh, living in poverty if they have any children that they need, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, those, those numbers do not accurately reflect um, uh, uh, the economic conditions uh, and the real life conditions of folks living here. A couple more comments in the chat. Alex is observing that um, rent eats up our wage increases. I think that was the context of that. And Kelly Rose says, I know someone who was looking for rental housing recently and was told he must make five times the rent to qualify. Um, and Greta's on stack. Go ahead, Greta. Um, hi, thank you for being here today. I just was wondering if you could do a quick update of where I-135 is in the process. Um, so I-135 uh, successfully gathered 26,500 valid signatures from valid Seattle voters. Um, however, it took a little bit longer than expected to get those signatures. The initial batch we turned in fell short. 
Um, and so we won't be on the ballot. The I-135 uh, this November, I-135 will be on the ballot February 14th, 2023. Um, and so the campaign is doing a ton of work, mostly with volunteers to get out the word. Um, the, most of the people who vote in those off elections, those February elections are rich homeowners like me. Um, so definitely encourage, uh, if, if you're interested, just go to houseourneighbors.org to learn, learn about how you can volunteer with the campaign, uh, canvassing, tabling at farmer's markets, uh, reaching out to friends online, reminding them to vote uh, this upcoming February. Good news is it'll probably be a very short ballot. It might be the only thing on the ballot. Um, so uh, uh, should be hopefully easy to, to, to get out the vote. Oh, let me drop the get involved link in the chat. Oh, and Nancy, I posted it just above in the chat. How's our neighbors? Yeah, and, and huge thanks to all of the, the volunteers who came out and helped gather the signatures. Uh, uh, I did a bunch of that tech for housing, hosted a, a table at the Capitol Hill Farmers Market, um, just a few blocks away from Seattle Central. And um, it uh, typically a volunteer would gather about one, get about one signature every five minutes. Um, and about 70% of those are actually valid. They're legible. It's actually a person who's a registered voter. The signature matches what's on file. So to get 26,500 signatures involved, just an extraordinary amount of volunteers. Um, and, and now we need to reach 10 times as many people for a citywide election. Um, so it would be yeah, deeply grateful to anyone who can come help uh, and volunteer. And canvassing starts this weekend. Oh, Yvonne has an interesting comment in the chat. Do you want to tell us about that, Yvonne? I'm happy to oh, sorry. You... Eating some pretzels. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Yeah, so I grew up in Vienna, and so there was a lot of housing options, and uh, uh, really, uh, I think in Europe, it's one of the on the height in terms of providing decent housing, and that happened you know, after the war too. But going back now, I see kind of this same kind of those monster blocks of housing that nobody can afford, you know, and it really changes the architecture. And given a lot of them are on the outskirts of, of um, uh, you know, not the middle of the district, um, not the first district or so, but still it, you can see taking over as well over there that the new buildings are built for profit and oftentimes are ugly and changes the architecture changing changing the scenery and housing you know it is it is harder too for for people that just getting started and i think even a lot of privatization is happening so some of the house past housings are sold too so i i don't know exactly i don't have statistics but it's changing too you know because i always get get annoyed with certain things here and then I'm like well you know <laughs> it's everywhere it's just on the slower pace you know so but thank you for the work you're doing it sounds really good yeah I really appreciate hearing about that and, and your perspective on on, on that uh, so I'm sorry Tiffany uh, who's co-chair of the House of Members campaign couldn't make it today um, she and uh, Camille another co-chair of the campaign were in Vienna for about a week for a um, uh, a, a set of meetings about social housing just uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I think that was led by um, a state representative in Hawaii, because Hawaii has has passed a social housing bill and there are a bunch of legislatures, le legislators from, I think, California, which had a social housing bill come one vote short uh, uh, of passing. Um, and you know they did bring back some 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 good stuff like you know there are design architecture design competitions for a lot of the social housing in Vienna, um, which helps ensure that uh, from an aesthetic and design perspective the new housing that's being built is good. And, and you know some of the concerns you had about uh, buildings being converted over to the private market that's one of the reasons why uh, I one thirty five is has very strong legal language in there to ensure it's permanently affordable housing. Um, and, um, and and I think you know there are other there are other places. I think in Copen not not Copenhagen, uh, maybe in Amsterdam they have a 40-40-20 rule. Uh, out of all housing that's built, forty percent needs to be 
um, low income, 40% needs to be middle class and uh, and then only the remaining 20% can be for profit. I, I, I don't remember the details of that. I know that King County Council Member Garmai Zahile just came back from a trip there and, and was talking about that. Uh, he's also an endorser of I-135. Thanks for sharing. Yvonne, I'm so happy to know that you um, are from Vienna. Uh, Okay, thank you all so much. It's 1251. Technically and officially, we're one minute past the end of COSI. I am so, so happy to have had you all here. And thank you again so much, Suresh. Um, I do also want to reiterate that there are lots and lots and lots of opportunities to get involved, um, to learn more. Uh, I did a lot of signature collecting um, and watched a lot of it. There are tons. If you Google I-135 or How's Our Neighbors, there have been tons of educational events put on to teach us all more about a very, very complicated issue. So it's fun to watch those. And they have been presented by lots of different types of people in the city. And you can hear questions from lots of different types of people in the city. So I find that to be a good way to kind of um, get educated on the issue. Um, yeah, and we'll, the library has a guide for all the COSIs. So I'll make sure to link all of the resources that we've been talking about and ways for all of us to learn more about the issue. And then remember next February, you get that ballot in the mail. February 4th is Valentine's Day, folks. Yep. So when you're thinking of love, think of housing, love and housing. Okay. Thank you. Lots of thank yous in the chat. Thank you, Suresh, and thank you all for coming. Thank you all. See you again thank you, Kathy. Thank you all. Uh, yes, Sorry you're I gentrified welcome. your city. <laughs> More like you, Suresh. Okay, take care. Thank you, everyone.